tu atahi e e mea tika nu e fako ke atua no te reo fako mui mi tiki ngarik no nga manaki tanga kato i tau ki nunga i a tātau i heika mai rā i o tātau wā kainga ko tai pai mai a ki rata te tuni o tō tātau whare no reira e i hoa ko koutua no ho ki te mana te mauri o ngā mea katoa ko mātou e hui nei ki rata te tuni o tō mātou whare e whaka hoki atu nei te reo whaka mui miti whaka kloria hono reiki mui o koutau no ngā manaki tanga katoa i uhi mai ki rua ke mātou mai o ngā rā ki muri tai ni mai ki tēni haora Ka i noe te nei mātou e i hoa ke uto ni mai rā o koutu manā ki tanga ki runga ke mātou ma te roanga o te nei rā. I roto i ngā mahi ngā whakāra me ngā tūmanako e tūmanako hea nei a mātou ke o te anō rā i roto te nei hui hui ngā. I runga anō rā i te kūria tanga o te matua te tama te wairua tapu me ngā na hea rapono ko te māngai hei tau toko mai ai ni āke nei āhe. A o tira me huri atu anō rā ke a koutou e ngā mana e ngā reo. Ko te rai tatu mai e te whae te nga koe. E mahara tonu ana rā ki tō hoa ko ngoro rā i te tiru hanga kanohe i ngā tau ki muri. Ko koe rā tēnei e hāpai e mau tonu nei te ahua tanga o ngā mahi ko o tine i aia i rana te maunga taranaki o tae mai. Nō reira ngā mihi ano rā kea koe te nga koe. Tēnā koutou rā e ngā mana e ngā manu hili, ngā kanuhi tau hau ku tatu mai, haere mai, haere mai, haere mai. Haere mai rā me rātou e hane ki unga i tēnā i tēnā koutou, a kia huitahi anō rā me rātou, e hi ngā kenei i roto te kaipara, te taitoke rau puta noa i ngā tōpito e whao te motu, a kia huitahi anō rātou ki a rātou, a kia e rā, te wāhanga kia rātou te hunga kō moe, mui mai koutou i roto i ngari. Nō rira kia koutou, kia koutou ko mātura e nei, te kanuhi ora kia tātou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, a kia ora tātou. E konori, e koroia, Yeah. 
in honour of your late husband, Sir Paul Reeves, who did so much for New Zealand. Thank you, ma'am. I'm also thankful to Margaret Kalfaru. Where has she gone? She is a font of all wisdom when it comes to making things happen. So uh, thank you, Margaret. And thank you to our staff at Vaughan Park who have done many things behind the scenes. Vaughan Park and Massey University uh, started a partnership in 2012 with the inaugural lecture uh, delivered by Professor Sir Mason Dury at that time. Massey University is, of, of course, well known for being a pioneer in education, and it continues to ask questions, innovative questions, about the future of education in New Zealand. Vaughan Park is known for providing the gift of hospitality to either organisations or to individuals who need an, an oasis. This may come in the context of uh, a business or a university needing a quiet place for their strategic thinking, or it may come in the context of an individual who is at a crossroads and needs some time in an oasis. We host scholarships for writers, scholars, and artists, and we are interested in the interface of spirituality and law and politics and health and uh, individual need. Tonight we are delighted to host Professor Belgrave from Massey University. He is a well-known historian, I understand a bit of an icon here, and um, has been deeply involved in the workings of the Waihami Tribunal. Tonight he has mooted that the past can indeed inform the future and he has drawn from two Maori notables, Sunata and Ratana, to help us reflect on how Auckland may discover its future. I read a quote when uh, reading about the Stout Nata Commission in 1907, uh, where the commission said, Maori were a people starving in the midst of plenty. Having lived in the north for the last four years, I have now only just recently returned to the North Shore, to Auckland. And it seems that this city, Auckland, is bustling, full of vim and vigor and growth, a place of milk and honey. And yet I know that is an illusion. There are many social and structural issues challenging Auckland. And as a priest, I wonder aloud, if a city or a country had a soul, how might it find hope for its people's future? Well, we're about to find out. It is my honour to introduce you, sir, Professor Bogger. Uh, kia ora tato. Um, I'm delighted to be here. I mean, I, I, you know, since this is if this had been any other night in the last fortnight, I'd be congratulating you for coming out on such a miserable, uh, awful night and experiencing the crisis of New Zealand's tran Auckland's transport system on the way to getting here. But I gather the motorway was flowing freely and the temperature's about 17 or 18 degrees, so we are at that point when things don't look too bad. I'd like to start by acknowledging um, Sir Paul Reeves's role in two particular areas, one that's relevant to this talk tonight, and that is his role particularly in the Anglican Church in shifting what we historians often talk about as the Tory party at prayer um, from its more conservative and very, um, or to bring together those two strong aspects of Anglicanism in New Zealand one going back to the 1830s and the missionary presence in New Zealand, and the other um, with a settler church coming here, um, which is problematised both uh, in the life of Bishop Augustus Selwyn, um, who in the end in 1868 had to leave New Zealand unable uh, 
to reconcile the two parts of the Anglican Church, which he had the privilege of governing. Uh, Sir Paul's role, I think, was crucial in developing that um, rethinking of the mission of the church and connecting it to its missionary past. But I'd also like to acknowledge Sir Paul's role as Governor General at a time of enormous flux uh, in New Zealand. And I think his calming role when questions of Māori in the future were being argued incessantly in ways that we don't really do today um, is really important. And during that time, I had two invitations to Government House. Um, the first, I can't even remember what it was for, but the second was particularly memorable and probably, Lady Reeves, not one of your, um, not one of those events that you, you felt completely in control of. Um, Keith Sorensen published three volumes of the Bucknata Letters. Wonderful, wonderful correspondence between two major figures, one of whom I'll be talking about tonight. Uh, and they're worth reading just for their erudition. Um, they're wonderful uh, examples of good writing in English by two fine Māori scholars. The first volume, I think, had been... Uh, the first two volumes had been launched up the coast. The third volume was launched at Government House. And by the time I arrived, about ten buses from Ngāti Parau and about ten buses from Taranaki had arrived. And I think you were tearing your hair out, wondering how on earth you were going to feed any of these. And my little contribution to that night was to say, well, it, perhaps I should go home and have my baked beans and, and at least make one minor contribution to the evening. Um, it's, it's a complete coincidence that this lecture occurs on exactly the same day as the release of the provisional um, plan for Auckland. And I did think at one point that it would be a good idea to actually just scrap the lecture and, 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 and read the plan and, and, and tell you what was in it. Um, I got about through about 1,500 pages before lunchtime and decided, no, I didn't. Um, so I'm going to actually talk Pessimistically, I have to admit, uh, I could, I've labelled this, what should government do? Um, I could just as easily have labelled it, what could government do? And acknowledging Sir Paul's role and the Anglican Church's role in promoting social justice, much of the sort of content of this lecture is saying that social justice isn't enough. That there are fundamental values that exist in different times in New Zealand's past which allow certain things to happen. And they have good things and bad things. And I just want to compare um, two periods. Well, no, I'm looking at one period. Yeah, two periods. The present and the post-war period. Um, to try and look at what we can learn from the past in the sort of social policy problems that face us in the present. Uh, and we face some, some extensive problems in such a magnificent city. For in my view, Tamaki Makoto must be one of the great cities of the world. Um, its location and its cosmopolitan population make it an exciting and a wonderful place to live. And its problems are very much a consequence of its success. The thousand lovers have become well over a million and a half and we struggle to get them all in, to house them and shift them around the city in ways that are effective, environmentally sound and sustainable. And the problems of Auckland today are one thing, but as the, the, today's plan uh, explains, we're expecting another 750 to a million people to fit into the city over the next 30 years. Uh, that's a huge amount of people to put into an infrastructure that I'm going to explain was built for a very different sort of city. So I'd like to explore another time in Auckland's history when issues of growth were also put, putting particular strains on its infrastructure, its supply of housing, and when it was facing the consequences of increasing inequality and poverty. 
This is a time well in the living memory of many of you in this room, including myself. Um, the post-war world, that baby boom world, the fledgling, with its fledgling motorway system and its suburban sprawl. It was also the age of highly subsidised housing, state housing for the less well-off, and subsidised mortgages for the middle classes. Although high levels of government lending for mortgages go right back to the 1920s, something that we often forget. It was also an era marked by an egalitarianism significantly missing in today's debates about social policy in Auckland. And as a historian, I do have to acknowledge that the problems we have in the present is we think our own age unique, beset with problems experienced at no other time. And, and I think we even forget in the current crisis that in the 1990s, of course, we had two major infrastructure failures in the city, one of water and the other of power. And they're not unrelated to the problems that we have today. Anyway, my period begins before the war was over. When by mid-1943 it was clear that the Allies would win, Germany and Japan would be beaten, even it would take two bloody years of fighting before it was all over. And in the preparation, um, in that preparation for the future, memories of the economic hardships of the 1930s were ever present. They reminded New Zealanders that winning the war was one thing, winning the peace was something very different. Now, post-war New Zealand entertained very different ideas about society, the future, and the role of government than those predominating today. Ideas inscribed by these experiences of depression and war. I'd like to frame this discussion through the ideas of the two predominant Māori leaders, perhaps of the whole of the 20th century, Apirananata and Tahu Pōtiki Wurumura, ah, uh, sorry, Apirananata and Tahu Pōtiki Wurumuratana. These men mark very different interpretations of Māori development. By the late 1930s, Nata was coming to the end of his influence, just at a time when Ratanas was rising. For Nata, the late 1930s and 40s were a period of disillusionment, not only because of his being beaten in his parliamentary seat in 1943 by the Ratana Labour candidate, but because the world that he had worked for appeared to be significantly being undermined. His approach always focused on strengthening Māori tribal economic, social and cultural identity. His land consolidation and development schemes aimed at making Māori land productive, responding to non-Māori demands that Māori use it or lose it. His work with Māori communities always focused on tribes as collective entities, working with rangatira to strengthen tribal identity, promote cultural revival, encourage distinct iwi histories and identities. In this approach, there was no social development external to the tribe. But by the late 1930s, urbanisation and the introduction of a welfare state were beginning to transform Māori communities, and Māori and Nata viewed these developments with alarm, seeing them as undermining everything that he'd stood for. He saw young people moving into Wellington becoming detached from their tribal identity, lost in the cities, dependent on a welfare state rather than on the tribe. His view of social development idealised Māori life and economic tribal, sorry, um, a Māori life that was economically viable on iwi land. Now, if all of these objectives appear familiar, they have been they have re-emerged in the late 20th century and have now become the predominant focus of Māori development in the present. But by the late 1930s, these ideas were seen as old hat, failing to deal with Māori social and economic inequality. And some work that um, Grant Young, who's here, and myself have been involved with the East Coast, has illustrated just how limited the economic benefits of things like um, dairying were that the cream check got bought into the whānau once a week, did little more than pay for food, uh, for um, uh, flour and sugar and tea, um, and had no great significant economic impact on family uh, life before World War II. The few shillings a week from the dairy check had this limited spending power. While these dairy farms and skilled pride and provided new skills, the economic impact remained negligible. 
from the 1940s to the late 1960s, it was Ratana's view of Māori development that would prevail. One focusing on ensuring that governments were held accountable for Māori inequality, expanding the welfare state, improving Māori housing, giving greater access to educational opportunities and dealing with underemployment. All of these became the major focus for Māori development in this post-war period. A tribal focus did not stop. Ironically, and I think this is something that we kind of forget, in the 1950s, more land was returned to Māori control, it was already in Māori ownership, but it wasn't in Māori control, than at any time since 1840, before or since the 1950s. So substantial areas of land under government administration was returned back to Māori control in this period, considerably more than has been returned in treaty settlements in the last decade. However, from the 1940s, the focus on Māori development was very soundly, focus, uh, soundly attached to the urban world. Now these were Ratana's ideas, but they were fundamental to the more general thinking about futures in the immediate post-war period, nationally as much as internationally. Now most historians have focused on the sort of political differences between Ratana and Labour, between Labour and National, but through this entire period from the 1940s through to the 1970s, there was a significant political consensus, one that covered both major parties. Uh, National might have wanted to sell off state houses, Labour wanted to build them, but they both had a major policy of building houses and of building the infrastructure to deal with a rapidly increasing city and a rapidly increasing population. Much of this consensus, political consensus, rested on this experience of war and depression. Uh, in this post-war world, um, and this, this is a sort of a way of thinking, it, it doesn't, everyone don't, doesn't think this way, but it's a way of thinking that is very generalised and which has a major effect on what governments do. And governments have a very strong role in this world. Um, this embracing of modernity made society very forward focusing, very future focused, turning its black back quite naturally on what were seen as the blights of nationalism, racism and militarism, despite of course the Cold War. The new world for a post-war, which was also remembering the rather lacklustre interwar period following the war to end all wars, which was in 1919, the new world would be about economic growth, prosperity, and a citizenship based on modernity and equality. Equality of citizenships, a citizenship applied as much between nations as between individuals. And it's this period that the major vestiges of empire are disappearing as new nation states emerge, beginning in 1947 with India and Pakistan and most notably for New Zealand with the independence of um, Western Samoa in 1962. Within New Zealand, the emphasis is on social equality. Within a, an international nation, world of nation states, it's also in, on inequality. The civil rights movement in the United States and the anti-apartheid movement in South, in South Africa also emphasised the politics of equality over those of identity. For New Zealanders, equality trumped issues of race, colour, religion and history. Emphasising equality meant relegating what we would call today ethnicity, culture and even religion to a private world. Everyone was free to share in those aspects of their identity, but they should have little impact on the day-to-day -day life of people in the workplace, in the development of public policy, and even in international relations. While a specifically, and I'm talking as a historian, while a specifically New Zealand his, history would emerge in this particular post-colonial post -colonial era, its nationalist edge ensured that its focus was on the emergence of the present, 
of New Zealand as an independent and equal society, no longer under the apron, st apron strings of Mother England. Liberal public policy then focused on treating everyone the same and eliminating aspects of public policy which identified differences based on race, religion, and even, although this was more, sl uh, more slowly emergent, on the basis of gender. It might be remembered that in 1960 we had the first moves towards equal pay, with legislation bringing into equal pay in the civil service in New Zealand. Now, if all these assumptions that I've just discussed appear rather highfalutin and theoretical, I'd like to put them in the context of the Hun report in 1960. Now, in 1960, um, Jack Hun was made Secretary of Māori Affairs very temporarily in order to produce a report to recommend to what was a Labour government in office, but in fact a national government by the time the report was completed, the future for Māori Affairs. Today, the Hun report is treated very negatively. Uh, we see it very much as um, emphasising a form of assimilation and continuing a process of cultural assimilation which was described in the Waitaka Tribunal's 1987 report on Orake as cultural genocide. But I think we need to look more clearly at what Hun has to say in 1960 and to put it in the context of this more general band of ideas that I've just talked about. And I do want to make the point that Māori criticism of the Hun report, um, which culturally is led very much by your father, <laughs> doesn't really happen until the late 1960s. That in the early 1960s, most Māori opinion about the key aspects of Hun's recommendations and his findings, other than those that relate to Māori land, were more or less positive. They embraced Hun's belief that Māori had a place in the urban world. Now Hun argued that modernity meant that Māori, like Japanese, and he used the Japanese as an example, or Europeans, were going through a process of change that created a common citizenship, emphasising economic and social conversion. Uh, convergence, not conversion. Conversion goes back to the 1830s. Um, for Hun, this common future uh, was not institutional racism, which forced Māori to become more like Europeans. It was simply modernity, or in today's parlance, globalisation. Hun resisted and was completely offended by any suggestion that his policies advocated assimilation. For Hun, model government policy should be directed at ensuring that Māori had the same social and economic opportunities as non-Māori. It was all about equality. But, and this is a very important qualifier, Hun accepted that Māori would be different. Their cultural identity would be preserved despite integration. However, as I've indicated before, these aspects of cultural identity were to exist in the private space, to exist in family, to exist in one's belief. They were not part of the way that public policy should be adopted. They were not part of the way that an economy should be managed or structured. They should not get in the way of a common citizenship, both nationally and internationally. So if I can just sum up the point that I'm making here is that this view of post-war citizenship is an attempt to deny differences. It's based on the assumption that if we look at the things that we all share, those are the things on which equality should be based, those are the things on which citizens should be based. It should be blind to colour, blind to religion, blind to culture, blind to history. Now. In the light of that, let's go back and look at Auckland. Um, and I have some nice shots of Auckland and some not so nice shots of Auckland. And see the issues that faced Auckland in the immediate post-war period, which have many of the echoes that we have today. 
and try and look at the way that Auckland resolved them. There can be no doubt that post-war Auckland faced monumental challenges. Housing, in particular, was in crisis. And not just for the baby boom generation and migrants who'd rapidly increase Auckland's population, those living in the city at the time, but the many, the tens of thousands of new migrants who would come into Auckland that government in the city would have to accommodate with housing, schools, roads, hospitals, all of the infrastructure to we deal a with a rapidly expanding city. Um, housing was in crisis in 1945 because war and depression had meant that very few houses were built the sun and, the and houses had been very badly maintained, particularly housing for the, for the poor. And as we know, New Zealand houses were built of wood, uh, most of them on wooden piles, and without maintenance and without treatment, wood rots. Something that builders and planners seem to forget in the 1990s, but that's another story. So there were surveys undertaken of the condition of New Zealand housing and Auckland housing, and they were pretty awful. They showed poor quality housing, unhealthy housing, overcrowding housing, and the surveys of Māori housing in the 1920s and 1930s were, were diabolical. Um, conditions, um, a survey taken, for instance, of Te Hapua that I looked at many years ago, showed a community of 350 people in the 1930s where 75% of the population had tuberculosis, where only one house had real windows, um, where there was no reliable water supply uh, in summer and far too much water and mud and not much else in winter. So there was a crisis in housing and certainly these this understanding of the problems in housing was one of the reasons why the first Labour government put so much emphasis on housing. In Auckland, there was the inner city, places like Freeman's Bay, parts of Ponsonby, um, Kingsland. These were the places where the worst housing was, where the working class lived, where much of the jobs had been. Uh, jobs associated with the wharves, the freezing works, and a whole series of industries in the inner city um, where working people could walk to work. The pre-war Labour government had already laid down the foundations of its approach to social development, a policy of universal protection, protection from economic competition from outside the country, and social security was used to ensure income support for the unemployed, older people, uh, although that was less generous, and the sick and the disabled. And then, of course, there was a highly subsidised to most free to the user healthcare system. But the most ambitious of Labour's policies was its housing policies. House building, providing homes for the people. But it wouldn't just be Labour's policy. For the next three decades, right three through until at least the mid-1970s, the building of houses will be one of the top social and economic objectives of government and central not only to its social policy but to its economic policy. And I'd love to show you some pictures of these houses um, just to show you uh, what great houses they were. If you had lived in slum conditions in the 1930s to come into a state house of your own a house that had running water, an inside lavatory, uh, its own garden, was like moving into heaven. Um, and I think so often today we are conditioned by the belief that government continues to reinforce that state houses are the refuge of those people who cannot find anything else, who are desperate, who are failures in some way. But the state housing system that was developed in the 1940s and 50s was aspirational. Uh, it wasn't just that people wanted to get into them, of course there was not enough of them. So there was a, sh a shortage meant that people were selected to get into them. You had to pass a respectability test. You had to prove and be vetted that you had the ability to look after your state house. 
So achieving a state house was not only an improvement in your social conditions, it was also an improvement in your social status. And I think that's very important in understanding the early success of public houses, not only in New Zealand, but also in the UK. The houses weren't large, and one of the most significant aspects of these houses was the huge sections that they had. Thousand square foot houses, under a hundred square meters, sitting on a thousand square meter quarter acre sections. And we have to ask ourselves why in New Zealand did we go for this sort of housing? There were some high rise public houses built in Auckland, um, Grays Avenue, a couple in Wellington, but almost all state houses were. Uh, dwellings, sometimes multiple dwellings, but often single dwellings on large pieces of land. In Britain, much of the state public housing went, went high, what were called streets in the sky. Um, now much of that housing has had a very poor press, but it too in the 1950s and 1960s offered wonderful opportunities for those rehoused in them. Uh, it's only later in the, 60, in, the, in the 1970s and 1980s when they fall into neglect that, that they can be seen as social problems. Why we had gardens really is the culmination of a long debate going on about how you house the working class in Britain. Because, and this is a fundamental aspect of this whole paper, Public housing for low-income people has been the only way, publicly funded housing for low-income people has been the only way of providing high quality and affordable housing to the population as a whole. But in New Zealand, housing wasn't just to be a house. It had to carry connotations of what was called the garden suburb. The garden suburb carried views that some sort of rural existence was really good for you, morally good for you, and even if you were living in a city you could have the best of both worlds. You could be part of a city but you could also have your own garden, be in control of your space. Um, that form of housing dominated. It was often designed by European architects, many of them uh, refugees from Nazi Germany who had much more grandiose views about how to build communities. Uh, Nainai in Wellington is a very good example of what they were trying to achieve. Sort of cooperative communities, places where people would go and play darts and have conversations and drink coffee. New Zealanders didn't want any of that. They just wanted their suburban house. The social aspects of this were huge because they meant that the entire society apart from the very rich were aspiring to exactly the same thing a suburban house and I grew up in a privately purchased and built house in 1952 that looked almost identical to the state houses that were built around the corner so good were these houses that they became the model for ordinary middle-class housing It wasn't just housing, of course, that was part of the social revolution. The other aspect was the internal combustion engine. Cars for the middle classes and buses for the working classes. Building such a low density city consumed large areas of farmland, often good horticultural land to the south of Auckland and after construction of the Harbour Bridge on the North Shore. However, those of us who know on the North Shore know that we don't occupy good horticultural land. We farm clay. Um, considerable debate has been taking place on the lost opportunity of providing an integrated public transport system in the 1950s. Um, yet in the priorities of the 1950s, the outcome seems to me almost predetermined. Cars were still expensive and rare. You had to have overseas capital to buy a new one. 
and the idea of motorway congestion was little considered. I had a wonderful photo of the southern motorway at Penrose with about five cars on it in the middle of the day. Um, the motor car, like the detached house, was a symbol of the future. It represented California and the South Pacific, and public transport was little more than a step to the utopian quality of every family having a car of their own and the freedom to go wherever they wished. In any battle in the 1950s and 60s between public transport and the private car, the private car was inevitably going to win. Now, all of this development required a somewhat heavy-handed but highly supportive government. New Zealand has always, from the, at least the later parts of the, well, middle of the 19th century, relied on government a kind of benign fatherly government um, to manage the economy and to be involved in society in ways that were quite unusual um, in a late 19th century liberal environment. By the 1940s, of course, after the failure of the international economy during the Depression and the need for a command economy during the war, uh, the role of a benevolent state was fundamental to addressing the difficulties that Auckland faced at the time. And to say this was as much true of Māori affairs as it was of anything else. And to say the Department of Māori Affairs in the 1950 was a state within a state. It managed Māori land, housed um, the Māori Land Court, was responsible for social development, employed social workers, engaged, <coughs> engaged in land development schemes, built and provided funding for housing, and under Tipi Ropiha was under Māori leadership. The role of the Department of Māori Affairs illustrate, you know, a, a department that would come under enormous criticism for Māori by the 1980s, but one treated as a department, you know, an, an organ of the state, and indefinitely problematic because of it, but also an institution supposedly dedicated to, to Māori well-being. Time is moving on. Somewhere in the 1960s and the 1970s, something went wrong with this vision. Much of the challenge came from the generation that had grown up in the baby boom world. The children who'd consumed the school milk, been clothed by the family benefit, educated in the new schools, and by the 1960s, universities built especially for them, with more choices and more income than any of their parents and their grandparents' generation. In retrospect, much of this youth revolt appears somewhat self-indulgent, a generation spitting the dummy, my generation spitting the dummy. However, the issues that they raised were not insignificant. Despite all the emphasis on equality, inequality persisted, particularly for Māori and Pacific migrants who'd come into this new world, promised an equal place at the table, um, but feeling not only second-class citizens, thank you, but deprived of the warmth of a cultural heritage seen as existing somewhere else. All of those aspects of identity that had been pushed to one side in the interest of common citizenship suddenly became important again gender, ethnicity, religious identity, and even some that hadn't been acknowledged in the 1950s, such as gay rights and sexual preference, become important. The distinction between public and private that had been made so strongly in the 1950s had never gone as far as legitimizing homosexual activity. All of that would have to wait for the identity politics of the 1980s. Those state house suburbs that had once seen the step up socially and economically were growing older. They were now being described as the places of a new form of poverty. Ian Shirley, who was a, a professor of social policy here in 1979, wrote a book based on his experiences of, develop, of community development in Glen Innes arguing that poverty hadn't been eradicated, it had simply been shifted from the inner city, which was being gentrified, 
out into the edges of the city. In all of this, the government, once the legitimate director of public policy, became a far less benign institution. For Māori, the welfare state was tr transformed into an instrument of dependency and institutional racism, perpetuating an attack, an attack on Māori autonomy which could, could be traced right back to 1840. After 18, 1984, a series of sort of inchoate criticisms from the right and the left about the welfare state, about the 1940s and 1950s, were resolved by the victory of the neoliberal fourth Labour government. Now it's 30 years since the reforms that were enacted have been passed, but they still underpin the public policy, the social policy that has been developed ever since 1984, uh, in the same way that the first Labour government's reforms of the 1930s underpinned the period that I've been talking about up until now. No longer was the state expected or even trusted to promote equality and reduce social and economic inequality. And the very epitome of this policy change is government's limiting of its social housing policy to those in desperate need and its complete powerless to have any effect of role in dealing with Auckland's current housing crisis. If we turn back to the two men that I've used to frame this discussion, then it's clear that since the 1970s, Ratana's approach to public policy has been substantially displaced and Nata's tribally focused ideas have re-emerged and predominate. Māori, and it could just as easily be almost any other group in New Zealand society, have shifted from a reliance on universal measures to ensure equality and to reduce poverty to espousing tribally focused, specifically targeted measures which recognise cultural difference and promote tribal development. Outside of the Māori world there may not be tribes, but the same applies. There are communities, special interest groups, industries, and even a differentiated, highly differentiated voluntary sector. The emphasis on tribal development, reinforced by treaty claims and treaty settlements, has promoted a renaissance in Māori identity, hugely influential in the development of performing arts, language revitalization, and the emergence of economically viable tribal identities. Accompanying these creative developments have been policies like Fanawara, which emphasise by Māori for Māori delivery, transferring the responsibility for social well-being from the state to Māori communities themselves in health, social services, education, and even aspirationally in criminal justice. The problem remains, however, that none of these initiatives have been able to reduce the inequality which emerged as a direct result of the reforms of the 1980s. This inequality has persisted irrespective of the state of the economy and it affects Māori much more than it affects non-Māori. My argument in this lecture has been that housing which is fundamental to social well-being and to resolving issues of inequality, the 1940s and 50s got that right, has always required state intervention to ensure a population is securely and safely housed. There will always be those on the edges difficult to house, but these should be on the periphery of housing policy, not the be-all and end-all of it. It's difficult looking into the future to see a government taking a much greater role in providing houses for all in New Zealand and returning to the universal policies of the post-war period. The culture shift just appears too great. However, between the 1930s and the 1940s, when Nata's ideas were displaced by those of Ratana, it would seem extremely unlikely that those supposed conservative, hierarchical and culturally specific policy of the ageing Māori statement would emerge anew as they had by the 1980s. In the same way, those universalist objectives and emphasis on universal well-being and universal human rights, which animated much of the grand view of Māori futures in the 1950s, 
could well re-emerge sometime in the future, but it would take a crisis for that sometime to be sometime soon. That's it. <laughs> well, it's it because that's where I thought. Thank you very much, Professor, for enabling us to have a deeper understanding of the subject. We're going to now open to the floor and see if there are any questions um, that you would like to ask Professor Barbary. There's something else happened after 1945, and that is, for the first time, New Zealand saw itself as a nation and not a colony. Um. I think, I, I mean, that, that's a key part of what I am saying, is that that sense of New Zealand being an equal nation and having equality within it um, is, is part of this rejection of empire, rejection of history, rejection of the past, rejection of identities that, that are not fundamental to living in a deep, you know, post-colonial world, if you like. But equality came with measures. Like Sorry, with with measures. Some people were certainly more equal than others. And throughout the 50s, 60s, 70s, um, if you had an import license, then you could print money. And most of the wealth of New Zealand's wealthiest families came simply at those times because they were given pieces of paper by the government. My next door neighbour's brother imported cranes. He did very well. I'm not saying that equality was achieved at all. Um, and I think one of the reasons why the period that I've actually rushed over, um, the criticisms that emerge, why this actually starts to fall apart by the 1960s, is that those aspirational claims for that period never completely delivered that degree of equality. However, having said that, and this is a point I really want to make, um, the level of social equality in New Zealand between 1945 and 1984 uh, was greater than at any time before or since. So a substantial level of social inequality, inequality was achieved. And certainly for Māori, um, despite all the problems of urbanisation, the improvement in life expectancy, the improvement in morbidity, the improvement in housing is substantial um, over that period. Now some of those changes you can't do again. Some of them are about infectious diseases and tuberculosis and things like that that are, that are one-off changes in a population. Um, but none of the level of, you know, We've seen an almost fixed level of inequality in New Zealand since 1991, um, which has changed a little bit, got a little bit closer in the last um, few years, but nothing compared with the level of, 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 of equal, you know, greater equality that was achieved in that post-war period. And much of it... I am admitting, cannot be replicated. <laughs> Much of it was a one-off. Much of it was about those special circumstances of the time. Could you tell us a little about the role of iwi in housing provision? Um, in when? Well, um, the Department of Māori Affairs was, was the place that produced housing for Māori. Uh, I had a, a picture of a 1970s state house um, produced um, by the Department of Māori Affairs, funded through the Department of Māori Affairs. Um, the best that you could say is that iwi, relation, iwi had specific relationships with the Department of Māori Affairs, depending on where they were and use those relationships to influence what they saw as, as government policy. Nata's um, schemes of land development, uh, of dairying, aimed at producing you know, family farms with houses, um, improving um, living standards that way. Um, though, as I say, their effectiveness 
in improving living standards was pretty marginal before the post-war period. Um, so in effect, um, I mean, Māori built whatever houses they could with whatever resources they had. Um, but iwi themselves, apart from you know, general whānau supporting whānau, uh, didn't have the capacity to build houses. Sorry, I've been... Well, um, the, the, the building of, of houses around, around Marae, rural Marae, has been a major feature of, of trying to revitalise rural Māori communities. Um, the problem, one of the problems with this is this, this modernising vision in the 1940s and 1950s through to the 1970s um, denigrated life in rural communities. It actually prioritised living in the cities. Uh, so as things like health standards improved, um, local authorities were loathe to provide sewerage and water supplies to these sort of ribbon rural communities, wanted them, wanted people shifted into the cities, wanted them closed down um, because of the increased costs of supporting these rural communities. So there's a, there's a point when urbanisation shifts from 1940s, 50s, into the 60s, where rural, Maori rural communities still are vibrant and are still very much connected with this urbanisation process. Uh, Melissa Williams has just produced a really good book on um, um, urbanisation of Maori into Auckland as it being a very positive and, and a sort of coherent tribal event. But in the 1970s, that level of rural depopulation becomes um, really damaging to the existence of many of those communities and much of it is forced by public policy. Again, emphasising equality and not seeing Māori as having any special uh, relationship with the land. Something that Han had actually argued in 1960. Han argued that Māori would leave rural communities and get a section in town and that would be the new Turanga Waiwai. And this he was criticised for. Um, how can we advocate to, go, to, to relax or provide an amnesty period for Māori to develop their unused lands? Um. That's a whole different ball game, <laughs> and one that I'm really not qualified to comment on. But you know why I'm asking it, though, really, aren't you? Because you, you, you talk about the urban Yeah. I get that. Yeah. But Māori are living in, in an urban environment that they simply can't afford. They have their asset rich with their lands. Um, some of that is happening, but in fact, as I said, depopulation occurs in the 1970s, but then in the 1980s, once unemployment increases, a whole lot of people just go home. So there's a reverse shift of people going back into rural communities. If I'm going to be unemployed, I might as well be unemployed back home rather than in the city. It's going to be cheaper. And then you've got a, a bunch of, um, of, 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 of shoddy, you know, poor quality housing um, being put together. I mean, at one stage, I think, you know, by the 1990s, or, uh, the Northland had, had so many sheds, legal sheds, that people had built that, you know, it didn't need anywhere near those sheds. They were simply being built. They could be used as dwellings. Um, so I think, I think there's always that tension between ensuring that, that um, those specific Māori needs are met but also ensuring that there's a, there's a level of social e equality. And what, so I suppose what I'm arguing is that just focusing on Māori and Māori needs specifically um, means that we can often be blind to the needs to much more general universalist policies 
that, that might have a greater impact than those that are only targeted to specific needs. Um, one of the things that the Taranaki Māori Trust Board, when it first got its money in the 1940s, did was to buy a tuberculosis x-ray bus uh, and to go around and take x-rays for tuberculosis of the whole communities. They wanted to focus on Māori, uh, but in the end they actually dealt with the community at large. So some of those more general policies actually can provide more delivery. Things like insulation of houses, um, which has been something that's been emphasised, greater emphasis. Um, so population-based policies may deliver in ways that simply by Māori, for Māori, targeted stuff will deliver some things but not others. At the moment my feeling is that we're focusing too much on a sort of welfare provision type social policy that recognises need but in the end is, is little more than a military. And if our social housing policy only deals with those people who it's really, really difficult to house anyway, um, then the needs of those people who can't afford, you know, in full employment, can't afford housing. Um, government may actually be driven more by the cost of its um, uh, accommodation supplement, which is huge, to actually find other ways of ensuring that housing policies are put on a better direction. What is clear in a number of um, publications going back to Joan Matcher's um, history of Ahipara, which she called Kotari, but Ahipara, um, Pat Hoepa's um, study on Weimar in the early 1960s, and more recently Melissa Williams' book, is that urbanisation in its early phase could actually be really positive in reinforcing both Re developing the rural communities from which people came and came back to, providing resources from the cities back into town, but also providing a sort of cultural half uh, for those communities remaining. Uh, at the launch of Melissa Williams' book, one of her participants stood up and said, we came to the city for a better life and we got it, which is quite different from the, the city being seen simply as the alienating place where Māori lost language, lost culture and became isolated and alienated. The Nata picture, if you like, of urban life. Um, so I think we're getting, historians have got a much more balanced view, I think, of Māori experiences in the city. Um, one of the problems that has been identified is that when Māori first go into places like Freeman's Bay, you can live really close to people because it's a small community. But when Fano is split between Te Aratu and Ōtara and Glen Innes, then those sort of networks of communication are much harder to, to keep in check, particularly when all the transportation networks bring you into the city and out again. 
Nata and Ratana were the prophets of their day. Who would be some of the prophets today who foresee what it might look like in 20, 30 years more? No idea. <laughs> um, How would you crystal ball it in 2030? The difficulty is, is that cha major changes in the way that we see the world are born of crises. You know, crises of depression and war, the crises of the, the sort of late 1960s to the 80s sort of generational gap and the angst of that period. Um, so it's hard to wish a crisis, on the, a crisis onto the future uh, in order to predict a different uh, a way, in, a difference in the way that we make view things. Um, uh, it's always risky, and I've always found whenever I've been tempted, as historians often are, to make prophecies, um, it's much, much better, as they say, to make a prophecy about something occurring a hundred years present rather than. 30 years present, you might unfortunately still be alive to see how wrong you were. Um, Any last questions? But coming back to your point about crises, I mean, all crises really do is for some unanimity of purpose. Sorry, I'm, I should be. All crises effectively do is for some unanimity of purpose. Yeah, the, the word force might be the critical one in that, though. Mm. I would, I, I will just add one because it was really on the end. If I was going to say what might change the current environment, um, I think I would suggest that we are sitting again in an intergenerational um, situation. Intergenerational in the 1940s and 50s, the post-war baby boom period, and then intergenerational in the 60s through to the 80s. But quite clearly the decisions that are being made by Auckland, for Auckland today are being made by those people who grew up in these garden suburbs and still very much driven by their memories of the first motor car that they got when they were 18. Um, uh, whereas I think there is a new, there is a, a younger generation who has a very different view of the motor car, um, isn't as convinced that it's that useful, isn't even learning to drive, um, uh, has a different view about the value of suburbs as opposed to the value of a lively inner city. Um, and I think the, the the debate that occurred in the council over the um, voting for the, you know, in, in February of the last plan showed itself as to be a very intergenerational conflict between those people wanting to see, uh, young people wanting to see an Auckland that's quite different from the Auckland of their grandparents, but their grandparents still holding the positions of power and authority to make the decisions. So if we do have a crisis, it's most likely, I think, to be an intergenerational one as that generation that appears quite passive and quiet today finds a voice over some issue in the future, and it may well be living in the city. Yes, but, but, but when the gen younger generation is, is invigorated by a figure who looks like the first Doctor Who um, <laughs> in the United States, sorry, um, you're too young to remember the first Doctor Who. Um, he was the oldest of all of the Doctor Whos. Um, yes, I, I mean that intergenerational issue is, I think, one that we can look at. As, a, as, a, as an academic, I've seen students become milder, and more passive, more accepting, less questioning. Even social work students, Krista, who used to be the you know the volatile, questioning and, and dramatic ones. But if we look at what's occurring in American campuses, I think we can see a new politicization of young people that we haven't actually seen for a long time. 
Um, so yes, and certainly Brexit illustrated that those people over 60 voted to go out, while those people under 30 voted to stay in, which seemed to be almost immoral in my view. Um, so yeah, maybe it is going to be generational. Or maybe not. <laughs> I have a huge faith in democracy. Um, oh God! Yes. Oh, sorry. I was in England when Brexit happened. I, I, that did question, and 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 I have to say that Trump and democracy do not go well together in in any lexicon. Um, <laughs> I, I come, having spent three and a half weeks overseas, um, being in Britain during Brexit, looking what's happened in the Philippines, looking what's happened in the US, I came back to New Zealand feeling much more confident in the nature of our political debate. Um, I think that New Zealand's political debate rests in a much more sounder, rational um, sort of plane than certainly was occurring in the UK and is certainly occurring in the United States. Um, whether that just means we'll catch up eventually, I don't know. But I do think that um, the fact that we haven't had the level of irrational, anti-immigrant, anti, just irrational political um, debate occurring in New Zealand that's occurred in both Britain and the United States um, maybe I'm being overconfident, but um, it did seem to me that we were doing this slightly better. And really, do I say that? Now, as a historian, I've just written, I've just got the proofs of a, of a um, history of this university. And I've got the conclusion to write, but other than that, it's pretty well finished. And I've realised, as I was just saying before, that I almost say nothing about anything that happens since... No, uh, since about 2000. The reason being I really can't see the outcome yet. Until I can see the outcome, I really as a historian don't really have the, the capacity to say much about it. Um, and you know, for that reason, any comment on where we are now uh, may be revised substantially by events that occur tomorrow, next week, next year, sometime in the next decade. Uh, the future always surprises us. And if it doesn't, we're lying. As a historian, do you don't feel any responsibility to tell people what we were thinking about at the time? <laughs> Instead of waiting a hundred years and telling what we were thinking about? Um, sometimes I do. Um, but in this case, I've got to live with these people. <laughs> <laughs> Because not only do I have to tell them what they were thinking, I have to tell them what I was thinking about their thinking. <laughs> and that's when it gets risky and dangerous. A final question. No? Michael, thank you so very much. I see you're also a diplomat as well as a historian, the way you evade certain questions. <laughs> very well done. Um, we have a wee something for you to say thank you. It uh, won't enable you to buy a bigger house, but... <laughs> no, it looks about the size of the house that we're going to have in the future. <laughs> <laughs> I fear for the youth. <laughs> and um, Lady Reeves, this is for you to say thank you for honouring us with your presence. Thank you very much. <laughs>